welcome to the Theology Mom podcast. Ma, thank you for watching today. I am so excited to bring you this conversation. And I hope that by God's grace, you are staying well, you and your family, um, staying warm. Hopefully spring will be here soon. And we have been enjoying some lovely weather here in Southern California. Um, this is a pre-recorded interview that I'm going to play today with a new friend of mine, Callie Mitchell. Callie is living in, with her family in Israel. She is a Gentile believer, but is very involved in the Messianic Jewish community there in Israel. And I've asked her to come on and share just a little bit more to give us some appreciation about the special relationship that Christians have with our Jewish friends. And I have to admit um, that I have struggled over the years uh, to find a reliable conversation partner to interact with about my friend, about my questions related to Judaism and Jewish culture. And a couple of months ago, a follower came on my page and um, made some comments to the effect of basically calling people to start observing the Torah and all of God's laws in the Old Testament. And Callie, my guest today, came on there and started interacting with this Torah observant, self-proclaimed Israelite on my page. And I thought, wow, this, this gal is giving some really thoughtful answers to these questions. And I was so impressed by the quality of her comments that I reached out to her and asked her if we could have a Zoom call together. And we talked on the Zoom for a while and I asked her a bunch of my questions. And I have, we've continued to talk since then online and um, through DMs and stuff. And I've been so blessed by our conversations and the, the quality of the interactions that we've had. She's a very bright gal and really has helped to um, help me dig in deeper into the, the Messianic Jewish perspective. And I've been so grateful and my perspective has become so much richer as a result of it. So I've asked Callie to come on. We just finished recording the conversation. I know you're going to enjoy it. She's full of information, but she's also so relatable and highly personable. So with that, here's my friend, Callie Mitchell. All right, I'm glad to welcome my friend, Callie Mitchell, uh, joining us from Israel. You might be my first international guest. Oh, wow. Well, I mean, that makes me feel really special. <laughs> yes. Oh, it is. It is my honor and very special for me to have you here today. And um, maybe let's just start by introducing you to people. And um, maybe just at the top, we should say, like, you're not coming into this, you know, like you have a big PhD in Old Testament studies or anything. You're you're a mom. You lead a mom's group in Israel. You're going to tell us a little bit about your background and stuff, but we're just going to have a conversation and talk about your heart for the Jewish community, your heart for evangelism, and um, some of your thoughts uh, about the challenges of evangelism in that community. So yeah, Kelly, why don't you just get us started here with a little introduction of yourself. And I'd love it if you could include, you know, your little bit about your journey into Jewish beliefs and culture. Yeah, sure. Okay, so I've been living in Israel for 14 years now, and I am a Gentile Christian here, married to a Messianic Jew. Um, and I grew up Southern Baptist, and the way that this all kind of happened was that I had a calling um, to overseas service when I was 19, and I was studying design at the time, so I hoped to do this as an architect. So I decided to go on and get a master's degree in architecture from the University of Cincinnati. And I asked the Lord to send me to a church where I would continue to grow in this calling um, to oversee service and intercultural ministry. And I had an invitation from a family friend that we had in Cincinnati to go to the Messianic congregation. 
there and um, I took her up on it. My best friend growing up had been um, Messianic Jewish in our Baptist church. And so I had a little bit of understanding, um, but not a lot. Um, so I went to the Messianic congregation. I absolutely fell in love with it. I went to the Intro to Messianic Judaism classes where I learned about their theology and their history. And uh, then I went to Africa on an internship for five months. And I really, so I really thought that I was just passing through the Messianic congregation to take this understanding of the gospel being to the Jew first and to the nations with me. Um, but when I got back from Africa, all of the Jewish matchmaker mothers there were saying, you should meet Devin Mitchell. Well, Devin Mitchell had grown up in that congregation and he was already living in Israel. He moved here when he was 18 and went to Israel College of the Bible and studied theology. And then he went to China for a year to serve the Lord. And then he came back to Israel and got his citizenship here, he made Aliyah, um, and he went into the IDF. And so life worked out such that we were able to meet. Turns out they were right. Um, so we got married a few months after he got out of the IDF. And um, here we are now with four children in the center of Jerusalem. 14 years later, we're all citizens. <laughs> So there you guys are living in Israel, and uh, I know that you do a lot of outreach to the moms there. You said you're going through the Mama Bear Apologetics book. Yeah, and side <laughs> now with your group. Well. So tell us a little bit about your ministry there and, and kind of your, your life. Yeah, okay, so my big vision was to be a, an architect doing ministry, making mud brick hospitals in Africa. <laughs> um, but instead, I'm here in Jerusalem, and I'm mostly making Lego towers with my children. <laughs> um, so it's not quite the same, but I am doing a little bit of architecture on the side. But I'm mostly doing um, work with this mom's group that we have. And I've been part of this group for 10 years, and I've sort of inherited the leadership role over time. Um, I'm a co-leader with another woman who's a good friend of mine. And uh, we are doing um, Mama Bear Apologetics because I really love apologetics. So that was just a natural fit for me as a teacher. And our group is just incredible. Um, we have women from literally every inhabited continent in the world in our group. Um, and this is, my husband says that we're alpha women. <laughs> He's like, I'm surprised you all get along as well as you do. Um, because everyone that's here is just so solid in their relationship with the Lord. They're either here serving the Lord from a different country or they're local believers who really had to make a lot of sacrifices to walk their faith out as Jewish believers. So there's just a lot of strength and commitment and maturity in that group. And I am incredibly challenged every time I go in to teach um, just by their faith. That's wonderful. So it's, quite an international community there, um, but their faith, to have faith is something that they really prize, it sounds like, yeah. value. Yeah. Well, let's, you mentioned earlier, um, you know, that your thought of how the gospel went to the Jew first. I think that that highlights, I want to dig into that a little bit more because um, Christians have a very special relationship with Jewish people. And it raises, I think, a lot of questions as to even, can a Jew also be a Christian? You know, can a Christian be a Jew? What does that even mean? So maybe we should unpack that a little bit. Sure. Um, yeah, I think one of the really special things about our relationship with the Jewish people is that we receive our salvation through their Messiah. Uh, and sometimes I think we tend to forget that. <laughs> um, so that's kind of the starting point. And then there's a way that we both bear the name of the Lord. Um, I think Ezekiel 36 is a really great example of this when it comes to the Jewish people. Because if you read through that passage, it talks about the Lord bringing the Jewish people in a state of unbelief and disobedience back into the land of Israel. And when he said, when he talks about this, you know, it's in first person. He says, it's not for your sake that I'm about to act, but for the sake of my holy name, I'm going to prove myself holy by bringing you into the land of Israel. And when he does that, he's upholding the Abrahamic covenant that he made with the Jewish people. So through the Jewish people, we see that God is a God of covenant. And this is a, this is a point that's really important to Messianic theology 
Um, because a lot of times Christians maybe think of God's heart for Israel or Israel's place in scripture as maybe a tertiary issue dealing with eschatology. But for the Messianic Jews, it's much higher. Like if we're talking about a triage of doctrine, it's much higher up on that triage. It's a high level, maybe second, like really high level because their, their um, relationship with the Lord establishes him as, as a God of covenant and it reflects his character and who he is. And um, Romans 11 says that the gifts and calling of God are irrevocable. So that calling and that, that covenant that he's established with them in Genesis is an irrevocable calling on them. And what's really fun is that Romans 11 also talks about our role in this process as Gentiles, which is to provoke them to jealousy. So they've been hardened in part, it says, until the full number of the Gentiles comes in. And what we're to do is we're to provoke them to jealousy in our relationship with the Lord. That They would see that we have something that they don't have, that we have this real love relationship um, with, with their Messiah. Um, yeah, so it's interesting too, because in the first century, the early church was mostly, and to begin with, it was mostly Jewish believers. There was about 5,000 Jewish believers combined with some Gentile proselytes you know, Gentiles who converted to Judaism um, before the Gentiles really started to come in. So what's really funny about that is that the question at that time was, well, what do we do with all these Gentiles? <laughs> so, you know, definitely uh, the Jewish people can be Christians. They can definitely be believers in their Messiah. That's the most Jewish thing anyone Jewish could do is to know their Messiah. But um, we do have some cultural hangups about that, too. Um yeah, that we'll definitely get into, but I think you've laid some really important groundwork there. Yeah. Because um, I think that it might pass by us as Gentile believers in the day-to-day that we are actually, you know, kind of riding on the coattails of Judaism. And yeah. uh, many of us might even walk through our lives and not know any Jewish people. And so it just, it doesn't even come up for us it's not on our radar but i think you're raising a really uh, provocative point in using this language of romans 11 of mm-hmm. because of our relationship with the jewish messiah jesus that that would provoke jealousy in in the jewish people that, that's such a interesting and, and provocative way of thinking about things I have so many questions, but I'm going to bunch my to, to restrain. But I think that um, this, for me, it, well, let me ask you this. It makes me wonder in your interactions with Jews there in Israel, like how how do they do? Do they feel jealous of us? Do they feel confused by us? Like I'm just wondering about that. Yeah. Well. For me personally, um, my experience has been that they they have a lot of curiosity. Um, you know, I very much am an evangelist in my spiritual giftings. I love to share my faith, so I'm not afraid to develop relationships with people who have a different worldview and really go there. <laughs> um, but years ago, we had a really amazing community. We lived in a neighborhood where there were um, several. I mean, I want to say like seven or eight messianic families. And we would all, all the moms, we would all meet in the park together with our toddlers. And so we made all these friends with these wonderful um, secular or religious Jewish moms. And we really included them in our lives. And um, we would, when we were together, if we had problems or we were going through something hard, we would stop and pray about it. And that was something that really ministered to our Jewish friends. They were watching us pray and i had one friend when we got together privately and we were talking about this and she said you you all call him lord and you talk about him like he's a real person that you know and i was like yeah well he is and he is our lord (laughs) um but there was a curiosity that our real relationship with the lord was provoking in them like they you know she's not the only one there's others um but they were just really like, what is this that you have that we don't have? And 
that definitely came from just allowing them into our lives and having real authentic friendships with them. Boy, that's that's so fascinating. Um, I'm really glad that you shared that story. It really helps to paint the picture a bit more. Um, now, one of the things I think that even a lot of uh, Gentile Christians are confused about is the issue of salvation. You know, we see under the Mosaic Covenant a lot of laws and a lot of instructions about sacrifices in temple and all of this kind of a thing. And then we get to the New Testament and it seems like a lot of that complication goes away. And I think that sometimes we as, you know, American 21st century Gentile Christians can fall, um, you know, unwittingly into a mindset, well, maybe God has two plans of salvation. You know, there's kind of the plan for the Jews and then there's the plan for the Gentiles. Maybe you can help us think better about that issue. Yeah, what you're talking about is called dual covenant theology. And this is the idea that the Jewish people have a separate path to salvation through the Abrahamic or Mosaic covenants. Um, and it's been really growing within Christian Zionism, I've noticed. And uh, I think it actually originates from... Um, an informed place of guilt about Christian anti-Semitism and also some confusion over how it is that the Lord could love the Jewish people so much and that he could establish a covenant with them and yet have them have allow their hearts to be hardened um, so that they haven't come to know Messiah Yeshua. Um, but it just really doesn't follow logically from God's word that the Jewish Messiah would only be for, for the Gentiles. Um, in fact, Jeremiah 31, 31 through 34 even talks about this. It speaks to a new covenant that the Lord is making with Israel and with Judah, where he will write the law on their hearts. So this, this message of the gospel, this message of the new covenant, it really is for the Jew first. It's established right there in his word. Um, there really is not any other way for salvation for Jew or Gentile. It's through Messiah Yeshua. And it's cut. It's a covenant that's cut with blood, just like the covenants throughout the Old Testament. Yeah, just to expand on that, and then you can, I would love to hear your feedback about this because this is something that I often teach in public. And, you know, if you have a correction for me or a way of clearing up my language, I would certainly welcome that. When I read the book of Hebrews, I found that very helpful um, explanation of how we relate to the Mosaic Covenant as Christians. And, and it's not that uh, sacrifices went away or the priesthood went away or the temple went away. Rather, all of these things are fulfilled in Jesus as the Messiah. So we still need the blood. We still yes. need a priest. We still need a sacrifice. Um, we still look forward to the heavenly temple in heaven, as it says in the book of Revelation, and you appears to heaven to the, a throne room, like a king, and also to a temple. And so there's this eternal nature of it, and, and that these things are all fulfilled in Jesus when he came. So it's not two different salvation programs Rather, through Jesus, everything is fulfilled that was pointed to under the Mosaic Covenant. Sometimes we call it types or shadows under the Old Covenant that are then completely fulfilled in Christ. So we still need a blood, the blood, the sacrifice, a priest, all of these things in order to draw near to the Father. I am I on the right track there with that? Yeah, definitely. <laughs> One of the things that I wanted to share is, um, you know, just you have been such a good uh, sister in the Lord to me uh, on this issue is I, I've shared with you um, that, you know, I had a lot of, I, I, I told you very upfront, like I have a lot of uh, prejudgments about uh, Messianic Jews, Jew, the Messianic Jewish community. And I, I told you, you 
upfront like okay um i got two issues or i got i got yeah. two things that it seems like whenever i interact with messianic jewish people or i see their content on youtube uh there's two issues is that they they deny the trinity and connected to that is that they deny the deity of jesus and they want me to become torah observant they want me to um comply with the mosaic laws particularly the food laws um now <laughs> i i've struggled with this and and you know um i admitted to you very candidly that this this is my struggle and you've been so patient and forbearing with me in introducing me to, to scholars that i didn't know about and streams of a, just a rich academic tradition in messianic judaism that i wasn't aware of and i've been so grateful for that and helping me uh work through some of those prejudgments so I'd, I'd love to just have you help us walk through some things here and share some of the things um you know just in a big picture way like again we're not trying to put you out there as a as a scholar but just to help uh people be aware of some of these issues from an evangelism standpoint in particular of we're going to share our faith or have dialogues with people with a jewish background these are some of the issues that that may come up yeah sure um I, I just want to acknowledge your humility to share this. I really appreciated that um, when we were having our private conversation about it, just that, that you were willing to be honest about this. And yeah, sometimes you are going to run into individuals who have some interesting beliefs, but I think that goes across the board for whatever kind of denomination. Whatever or, stream you're in. <laughs> yes, whatever you're in, you're going to find that. Because um, mainstream Messianic Judaism really does uphold the uh, core doctrines and beliefs of historic Christianity, but they do put a little bit of a different swing on it for cultural purposes. Um, but I initially I showed Krista in regards to the issue of the Trinity. I showed Krista the um, MJAA, um, which is the Messianic Jewish um, Alliance of America. Um, I showed her their faith statement that upholds the doctrine of the Trinity. And I also showed her the Jews for Jesus apologetic on the on the Trinity that was just very um, elaborate and rich in the way that they brought that together. Um, and I'll make to, sure to put links in of those resources in the description for people so that they can go check the, those out for themselves. Because what you said in our private conversation is, I'm not the first person that's kind of noticed like, hey, there's some people that that try to fly under the banner of messianic mm -hmm. judaism but aren't quite on board with some of these everything from historic christianity so entities like jews for jesus but like hey we need to we need to have a statement here uh, uh, mm -hmm. about our position yeah i think it's good to look at sort of the umbrella organizations and see what they believe and see what's being taught from the top down yeah. and then just kind of trust that if there's outliers, there's outliers. <laughs> um, but there is like a real interesting cultural issue surrounding the Trinity. And it really goes back to the history of the Jewish people with, with persecution and anti-Semitism from, from um, the Christian community. And, um, you know, I've asked some of my friends about it and they're like, yeah, just the word Trinity seems really strange. It doesn't seem like organic to their culture in any way. Um, so sometimes they choose to talk about it a little bit differently. They usually start with the Shema, you know, Shema Israel, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad. Um, Hear Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. So they take that as the starting point and they emphasize the fact that God is one. But even in the Shema, it has the Lord's name stated three times, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai. Um, so within Judaism, there's a compound sense of one, like with the word echad, there's a compound and there's an absolute. So um, in Genesis, we have a compound one where Adam and Eve become one. And in the Shema, Messianic community accepts that also as a compound one rather than an absolute one. 
Um, and you might hear some other ways of talking about it. Like you might hear them say um, that it is um, one with the uniqueness of three or um, God's triunity. That's another one that you might hear as well. Um, but it's really just an issue of expressing it in a way that's more accessible to their neighbors and more accessible for even them um, coming into their faith as believers in Yeshua from a Hebraic perspective. And um, well, this is what we call in in missions. We call this contextualization. Of yeah. How do we take this biblical concept and then translate it into a way that a particular culture can understand because every culture yeah. has their challenging issues when it comes to scripture. So what you're highlighting here is in the Messianic Jewish community, while they, they formally and without reservation affirm the historic Christian doctrine of the Trinity, they might for missionary purposes steer clear of using that terminology up front when they're engaging with their Jewish neighbors, um, they might use some different wording in order to bridge that gap culturally. That That's kind of yeah. what you're saying. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just to make it more accessible to the community around them and even each other and how they're talking about it. Because there has been this issue in their historic relationship to the church where when they would there, you know, like the, in, during the Inquisition, for example, there were first forced conversions and um, they were forced to eat pork um, to demonstrate that they had fully converted. And then um, there have been other times where they've had to renounce their Jewish identity. So um, they have this understanding that to come to faith means that they have to change ethnicity and become a completely different identity. And that's not just narrative, that's real. I mean, if you talk to, if you listen to their testimonies, you can see on One for Israel, for example, and even Chosen People Ministries, they have videos of testimonies where you can see people, um, Jewish believers sharing how they came to know the Lord and see what they struggle with. But that's a very real thing um, that they wrestle with this issue. And so even within Judaism, they've been taught that the Trinity is a uh, polytheism and that to think that the Messiah would have the character and nature of a man and God is idolatrous. Um, so to worship the Messiah is an idolatry. So that's what that's the background that they're coming from when they come to faith. And for me, it's really important to sort of differentiate, is this person contending with this issue and wrestling with it? Or is this a person who's adopted a a false teaching and actively promoting it. So that's, I tried that's to- really good. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I want to just highlight something you're saying there, and I want to make sure it doesn't pass listeners by is mm -hmm. the rough relationship that many Jewish people have a strong perception of Christianity and Roman Catholicism in particular mm -hmm. as being mm -hmm. a source of persecution for them. And there is a widespread belief among our Jewish neighbors that um, Christianity is an entity that has not been friendly uh, toward them, historically speaking. Mm -hmm. And this is a sizable obstacle for them. So when the, mm -hmm. the, the, the just even the terminology of the Trinity is seen as being a Catholic idea. Yes. Even though we know that historically it's not just a Catholic idea, but right. to, to not parse that out in the first conversation with our Jewish friends, like that's not a good strategy. Rather, there might yeah. be some other better ways to engage with them on this issue. Yeah, in fact, I, that, that was the exact word that my friend used, and I didn't want to marginalize your Catholic audience, but when I asked one of my friends, what do you think about the Trinity? She said, it just sounds really Catholic and just strange. <laughs> yeah. um, and it's not even like they necessarily have any problems with Catholic people today. It's just a foreign culture that has persecuted them yeah. in the past. Um, That's really good. So I want to jump ahead here to Torah observance mm -hmm. because that is another kind of big issue and 
I mistakenly had the belief that it was pretty widely practiced among the Messianic Jewish community that their whole goal is to get me as a Gentile and if I want to be really serious about the Lord, I must become Torah observant. And you were very kind in offering me some different perspectives on that. So so let's talk about that a little bit. Yeah, well, I have had an experience or two also where I've had someone pushy, a little pushy about certain issues that just were not practical for me um, to keep. I mean, over here in Israel, together, we all celebrate um, all the feasts, their national holidays. We, um, we all keep Shabbat. The whole nation closes down for Shabbat, and there's fines for businesses that are open. I think they're municipal, so different cities can handle this differently, but... Um, in Jerusalem, where I am, it's very religious, so everything closes. We have one pharmacy in the old city that's open. It's run by an Arab Christian family, <laughs> um, but everything closes down. Um, there's a lot of laws about raising pork on the land. Um, it's very difficult, almost completely illegal, very difficult. So people keep a kosher diet here. That is the expression of the Israeli people. Um and so I keep this too, but then there's a few things that when I go back to the States, they just aren't practical. And I've had a little pressure from a few people like, you should be doing this. And I'm like, it's just not practical for me. And I explained it. And then I maybe set a few boundaries around the issue. But mainstream Messianic Judaism does not hold, uphold what we call one Torah theology. So one Torah theology is the idea that Everyone who is a believer in Messiah Yeshua and Jesus should follow the Torah. And um, the what the problem with this, well, there's a few problems, but one of the main problems with this is that they make an application that's consistent for everyone and doesn't make allowances for differences. And if you look at the Word of God, um, there's really, when you look at Torah, well, to begin with, Torah is the first five books of the Bible. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. It's not just the law of Moses. And within that, you see that the Lord has different applications of the Torah for different people groups, beginning with the Noahide covenant that he makes after the flood for all the, gen for all the nations. And then from all of the nations, he separates and sets apart one nation to be priestly for him. That's the Jewish people. That's Israel the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And then from them, he sets apart from them. They came together in 12 tribes. And from those 12 tribes, he sets apart one tribe, the tribe of Levi, to be the priestly tribe. And then even from within the priestly tribe, he sets apart even like the Hohen ha Kohen, Hag ha Kohen Hagadol, the high priest. Um, and within that, there are different applications of Torah for everyone involved. There's different applications for men, for women, for Gentiles who aren't in Israel, for Gentiles who join Israel. There's applications even for the firstborn of the family. So the application of Torah is not the same for everyone. And the thing about the Messianic community is that they strongly believe, this is part of their theology, that the Lord made the Jewish people and he made Gentiles and that we are distinct. We are distinct um, peoples, and but we are mutual. And one of the things that makes us distinct is the way that we operate within this concept of covenant. So if the Gentiles were to come in and keep the Torah in the exact same way as the Jewish people, then that would take away from the distinction between the two of us. So it's not generally going to be the heart of the Messianic community to harshly or rigidly enforce that Gentiles all keep Torah the same way that they do. There might be some things that they're really, really passionate about and would like for you to join in with them because they see it as wise. And I feel this about a few things too. I'm with them. You know, this is my faith community now. Um, but there's some things that maybe seems like maybe there's wisdom behind doing this. Um, but it's not a rigid thing from the Messianic community for the most part because they want to keep that distinction clear between Jew and Gentile and God's plan and purposes. So is it looked upon as in the Messianic Jewish community that some of them still keep some of the Torah laws, some of them keep most of the Torah laws? Like, is it kind of a spectrum issue in the, in yeah. 
in the messianic community? Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's definitely a spectrum issue. Um, there's, you know, people have all sorts of convictions about it. And if here at Israel, especially because the thing is, is that uh, you can't even completely keep Torah without some rabbinic practices because we don't have the temple. So um, there's a lot of differences in opinion about what this should look like. And uh, most of my experience with Messianic Judaism has been here in Israel um, outside of a few years that I was in the congregation in Cincinnati. Um, But here in Israel, we have um, close to 300 congregations. I think it's 290. Um, And of that 290, only four congregations here keep a rabbinic style of Torah observance. Everyone else, we all have a heart to look more, um, I don't know if secular is the right word, but we don't, the heart of the Messianic community here is to not look like religious Jews, Um, but to be something different, you know, to bring, bring a different understanding of who the Lord is and what he expects and requires of us. So yeah, you're definitely gonna find different you know, um, different ideas about what this looks like and, you know, even what keeping Shabbat looks like, how much work you do on Shabbat or don't do on Shabbat. Um, there's no Shabbat police in the Messianic community. No, there's no Shabbat police. (laughs) Yeah. And some of it also is really dependent on where people live too. You know, I have some friends who live out in Judea and Samaria where they're with more a more religious community. And so they look a little bit more religious in the way that they live their lives in order to be honoring and respectful of their community. Um, my previous apartment, I live next to a rabbi and his wife, and they were religious. So there's things that I would not do on Shabbat. Um, like I would never do laundry um, because I did not want, they, could, they would be able to hear it. Um, so that the, sounds like though it was more it's more motivated by an evangelism purpose of well for me yes okay. because i just i kind of have this um heart like paul like to the jew i become a jew and to the greek i become a greek <laughs> but yeah i really want to be respectful of them so there's certain things that i just wouldn't do um but even now i i'm someone who will work really hard so i appreciate just taking the time to have shabbat and to not do chores or things that i don't want to do you know so i really and just really give the day to the lord so um it's really kind of in that sense become a personal conviction for me um but not a com- a conviction that i would pass on as a command per se but just something that's personal to me that I've learned from my Jewish neighbors and I've come to really appreciate. That's yeah. helpful. Yeah. And, and from what I understand, the the Messianic community there in Israel is pretty small. It's a small percentage of the population. And even the movement itself is fairly new. Maybe yes. I could make that clear. Remember that? Right. Yes. And um, the movement started in the late 60s and 70s, and it was part of the Jesus People Movement. And if you talk to the believers in the community from that generation, a lot of them will talk about how um, their faith really coincided with the reunification of Jerusalem during the Six Day War. That was sort of what triggered it for them. It was sort of like, whoa, the Lord's really doing something with our people. And that kind of awoke something, like it awakened something um in the jewish people and that's where it started so messianic judaism as we know it today is still fairly young because the leaders the foundational leaders of the movement are of the grandparent generation today um so we're really only like two generations of leadership in um and so it's been an interesting process i think just to see it grow and mature um so over here in israel it is pretty small We have um, low estimates, 10,000, and high estimates, 20,000 Messianic believers in Israel. I think worldwide right now, we have um, anywhere between 100,000 and 300,000 Messianic Jews. And that, again, is an issue of like, is some, how do you define exactly who is Messianic Jewish? Um, Like, how many generations back does the Jewish ancestry need to be for them to be, to identify as Messianic Jewish, you know? So there's some, some complications in getting numbers exactly. 
Um, but I think this, I've under, I understand this amounts to like less than 1% of the body of believers overall. Um, so it's still really small. So in the population of Israel as a whole, how many people live in Israel? I don't even have a context. For that. Yeah, we have 9 million people in Israel. Okay. So Israel is about- 20,000 versus 9 million. Yeah, that's a yes. small number. Yeah. Really small. <laughs> yeah. That gives some perspective. <laughs> yeah. I want to take a quick break here to talk to you about my friends at Birmingham Theological Seminary. Then we're going to get right back to my discussion with my friend Callie Mitchell. Right now, we're going to uh, watch a one-minute video from BTS. This is a wonderful um, opportunity for you to consider if you're thinking about seminary education. You might want to give them a look. So with that, here's my friends at BTS, and then we'll be right back to the conversation with Callie. My time with BTS has been a time of theological excellence but it's also been a time of learning practical personal ministry. The things that I learned here at BTS, I have implemented them into my ministry. I was not necessarily planning on getting a seminary degree. I just would choose Birmingham Theological Seminary classes that I was the most interested in that I thought could help me develop the most. But I ended up getting my MDiv from BTS and there's so much that I've learned. I'm really, really indebted to BTS because without it, I don't think I could have gotten this far. I initially started it because I had been called to a church had no theological education, but knew I needed it. So between having my first child, doing my first job, and having my first church, BTS came in and just sort of helped me to understand what it meant to be a qualified minister, and to be a studied minister that could rightfully divide the word of truth. Um, now, I keep seeing on social media something called the Jewish Roots Movement. Yeah. And it seems like what you and I have been talking about is a form of Jewish roots. Like, I can see the wisdom and benefit in making our faith so much more robust in the Bible and having an appreciation for the Jewish roots, if you will, of our faith. But I'm wondering if that's a different thing than the Jewish roots movement. And yeah. <laughs> it seems like these are kind of a group of people that want to uh, maybe bring Gentile Christians into being Torah observant. Mm -hmm. And I've had these people come on my Facebook page and, and encountered them and seen them on social media. So I was wondering, maybe you could just, obviously we're not going to go into all the details on this, but maybe we could just orient our listeners to some of the issues here. Right. Yeah. So what you're talking about, um, they mostly go by Hebrew roots. Okay. And yeah, and it is something actually very different than Messianic Judaism. Um, and it's so we should not conflate them. If somebody no. starts talking about Jewish roots, you got to ask them other questions. Yes. Are you talking about mainstream Messianic Judaism or are you talking about this other thing of yeah. having Gentiles be Torah <laughs> observant? Okay. Yes. And the thing is, is when I first started to see some apologists and Bible teachers on social media refuting this movement, I was a little bit confused myself because I was like, what? These people, I thought that they were Gentiles who really loved the Jewish people, had a heart for Messianic Judaism, and just gotten a little bit extreme. I thought this was a real fringe thing. And I was really confused about what was going on. Um, so I started looking into it for myself and asking around our community, asking some of um, the leadership in the Messianic community what this was about. And it is very different than Messianic Judaism. It has um, a history that's very different and really starts with the Gentiles. So what ended up happening is um, there were three different movements that sort of came together to form this Hebrew Roots uh, thing, <laughs> the movement, I don't know what you want to call it, um, but it was the um, Sabbatarian Christians, the Sacred Names Movement, and um, uh, oh goodness, it was, oh, the um, Worldwide Church of God with the Phryamite Doctrine, um, so the two-house theology, British Israelism, you know, that's what they taught at the Worldwide Church of God, so those three movements came together, and they 
Okay, so it's sort of related to Messianic Judaism in just a small way. There was, oh, a, there, <laughs> there was a group of Gentiles who became friends with some Messianic Jews and had gotten involved in the Messianic movement. Um, and something happened. There's a story behind it. It gets a little bit detailed. But they decided that they wanted to start kind of something that they called Messianic Israelism. So if you think Messianic Israelism is going to um, be juxtaposed to Messianic Judaism, right? So the word Jewish, that came from Judean, right? From the tribe of Judah. Um, so they're talking about two-house theology. And when they say Mess Messianic Israelism, they're referring to the northern kingdom of Israel that they call the Israelites. So um, they basically took the two-house teaching and the Ephraimite teaching from the Worldwide Church of God and applied it in a different way. And from this idea of Messianic Israelism, they started this group, this organization called the Messianic Israel Alliance, which was later renamed to the Redeemed Israel Alliance. And they also developed what they called the Hebrew Roots Network. And from that is what where we got the Hebrew Roots movement of today. But it is a completely different thing because it's Gentiles who are identifying as Israelites. Um, so it's a competitive movement to Messianic Judaism. And I don't even know if that's the right word because it's really antithetical to Messianic Judaism in a lot of ways. And it's also antithetical to the gospel in a lot of ways as well. Well, let, let's unpack this. This is all new information for me. So I'm going to okay. try to try to see if I can repeat back some of what you're saying here. So okay. we're going to call this, um, I think you called it the Hebrew roots yeah, Hebrew. Or, or one Torah theology. These are yeah, one Torah theology. Mm -hmm. two, two different terms for this. And so it was a combination of Seventh-day Adventism, which uh, in case people don't know, the Adventists, they hold to Sabbatarianism. So they see the Sabbath as being on our Saturday they also hold to a lot of the food laws and and that kind of a thing. So that was sort of one stream that went into the Hebrew roots movement. But then we had the sacred names movement. Is that the thing where we're not allowed to use the word God or we have to put a dash for, <laughs> or, or the O? Oh, yeah. Is that what that is? No. I, don't, I don't know yeah, what the they... sacred names movement is. And that's yeah basically they think that the names that we use for god today are pagan and incorrect so they prefer to use um yashua which is weird because that's not even a hebrew name um they also like to use the tetragrammaton um yute vave but they even pronounce it a little bit weird they have a different pronunciation that's strange and these things are like we ever here in israel we feel like they're a little cringy um because we don't, in Israel, we don't say yud hey vav hey. <laughs> okay. Um, when we read the Hebrew Bible, we say Adonai when we get to that um, in this tradition of the Jewish people. And even in our worship songs in the Messianic community, we sing Adonai in place. If, if, the psalm, if it's a song that comes from the Psalms or has scripture in it, it's always Adonai. Um, it's just really interesting to me that they do this. Uh, even when we pray in Hebrew, um, we say Abba or Abba or, um, um, oh goodness, um, a vein, a vein, uh, never mind. I won't tell you what we all okay. can say. <laughs> all right. So we've had Sabbatarian Christianity, sacred yeah. movement, and then the worldwide church of God, which <laughs> is now sort of defunct, but it was big back in the seventies. Um, and takes this idea of the 10 lost tribes from the north and then Gentiles are identifying with, I don't know, as some sort of remnant group. What, what do you think the appeal is of this idea of Gentiles wanting to become Torah observant? Like this, this seems... A little strange to me but these people that go down this path it seems to 
become like a, a they really want to bind everybody's conscience that if you really want to be a serious follower of Jesus, this is this is kind of how you have to do it. I mean, they're they're pretty yeah. um <laughs> zealous in their desire to to bring people into this stream. Well, what mm-hmm. do you think the appeal is for that? Yeah, they're super passionate. <laughs> Gosh, that's a good word. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting too is sometimes they like to tell me how I should be doing what I'm doing. <laughs> and I'm like, seriously, I live right in the center of Jer- Jerusalem. My street borders Maya Sharim, which is an ultra, ultra Orthodox neighbor. <laughs> I'm just like, you gotta be kidding. <laughs> um, but yeah, they're super passionate about this and it is interesting. In some ways, I think it's sort of a response to postmodernism. I think there's layers to it for one, but like, you know, we went through this thing in postmodernism in the church when I was in my late teens and early twenties, where we were all trying to separate out the commands of God from the traditions of man. And we were talking about how people were legalistic and Pharisees and all of this, you know, throwing out programs and um, looking for more spirit led environments. And I think as we've matured a little bit, we've come to see that there's some value in conserving tradition. And so we've seen, you know, younger millennials and even Gen Z going to more liturgical churches. And I think this is why the reform movement has kind of had a boom because people have been drawn to sort of the structure of their theology. And I think the Hebrew Roots movement kind of is a both and response to this in that they can continue to reject the traditions of man, at least to begin with, um, as as pagan, and at the same time, keep a little bit of structure to their faith life through Torah. Um, so I think that's one, one side of it. But what's interesting is that you can't keep Torah, like I said earlier, you can't actually fully keep Torah without some rabbinic influence because we don't have a temple. So they do still end up adopting some tradition of man um although this is a really big and broad movement so it's not like everyone's practicing it the same way but but there are people who really get into that rabbinic thought um it also does seem like they really have um a lot of skepticism or suspicion about church history um just some distrust with the church too so I think that leads them kind of into this direction. And uh, because they have a distrust with the church, I think that's what causes them to unfold into this process where they start to reject the Trinity and they start to have problems with Paul and start to reject Paul. So it kind of starts to snowball in that direction. And there is an appeal to it, I think, of, well, this is really the most biblically faithful way of doing this. Um, yeah, sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I could see the emotion yeah. of that. Yeah, because I think it does tend to sometimes draw a personality type where they like to be really right and be able to tell other people how they're doing something wrong. I've seen that too. And I I think it's also really an insecurity about being a Gentile in the Lord. I think that's part of it. Because these three movements that form this kind of Venn diagram that generated the Hebrew Roots movement, they all started at the turn of the 20th century. And at that time, that's when political Zionism had really started to rise up. Like in the late 1800s, um, Theodore Herzl came on the scene and we saw him really building momentum for a modern state of Israel. And we saw the Jewish people um, beginning to return to the land. And then that's when these movements started. Um, And so I think the Hebrew Roots movement, you know, it got started from people who had these friendships initially with some Messianic Jews. I mean, this isn't the only place that it started, but I mean, there's other people, but um, one of the main women who's known for founding this movement, that was her story, is that she became friends with Messianic Jews and then she started this. And the Messianic Jewish community really rejected them, which I think is understandable because if you're Jewish, you don't want someone subjectively identifying as an Israelite. That's offensive. Um, when you've gone through this history of persecution and your people have gone through the Holocaust and then suddenly you have a bunch of Gentiles saying, we're part of this ethnic group that you're part of too, but we can't claim that we're Jewish, so we're going to call ourselves Israelites. And they really do get this from the two-house theology. And I've seen it 
operate in three different ways. The most extreme is that all Gentile Christians are actually Ephraimites. Um, and then the next one down is a little softer and it's, okay, maybe not everyone's an Ephraimite, but if you are drawn to Torah, then you are an Ephraimite. So you should keep Torah. Because the thing is, is this Israeli or Israelite, sorry, Israelite identity is the linchpin for Torah observance. Um, so then the softest one of all would be, um, okay, so if you have received Yeshua, then you're adopted into the commonwealth of Israel, so you are an Israelite. But even that one uses the two-house theology to get there because they start out with the prophecy over Ephraim that he would grow into a multitude of nations from um, Genesis 48. And they start there and go through the story of the history of the um, multitudes that were coming in. And, you know, so that's how they get to that. Like we're part of that multitude of peoples who were coming in, the multitude of nations who were coming in to the people of Israel. So they start out with a very subjective identity as their basis for keeping Torah. And I don't know if you remember, but um, when we were dialoguing um, about some of the Facebook comments that you got, there was a there was someone on there who, who identified as an Israelite. Um, and I went through and I looked at some of the major ministries involved in this movement. I just went to their YouTubes and I clicked on their YouTube. I went to the search bar within their YouTube and I typed in Israelite to see what I could find. And sure enough, everyone that I typed in, this was a core part of their teaching was that they were Israelites. Um, so the um, the umbrella concern then is I'm an Israelite. I, I identify as an Israelite. That's mm -hmm. kind of the umbrella issue. Now, right. there might be three different paths of how I arrive at that conclusion, yeah. but the the core um, concern is I identify as an Israelite. Now, again, this is different than saying I'm a Messianic. I'm part of the Messianic Jewish community, and this is yeah something completely different. different. Yeah. yeah. So, path it, one is to say um, Gentile Christians are Israelites because they're descendants of the ten lost tribes. Yeah. Thus, <laughs> Christians are Israel and should keep Torah. Mm -hmm. a, a second path that you sometimes run into is, well, Gentiles have a unique interest in Torah um, because of being descendants of the 10 tribes. Mm -hmm. So we should keep, Gentiles should keep Torah. And the third is, well, I'm a Gentile. I believe in, in Yeshua, Jesus. I've now I'm adopted into Israel, so I should keep Torah. But Yes. These are all kind of different arguments that people might encounter, but the end destination is I'm an Israelite. But yeah, the point is that's, that's a subjective identity that's that's not really rooted and grounded in a, a scriptural idea a, at all. Exactly. Because the, the word, I mean, Genesis, I mean, sorry, uh, Romans 11 is really clear that that olive tree is composed of Gentiles and Jews, but their teaching is that they apply, they don't, they don't take scripture at its plain meaning. They apply some sort of mystery to it. And so in that passage, the teaching is that the Gentiles who are coming in are from this um, multitude of nations descended from um, Ephraim. So the Gentiles there aren't really Gentiles. They're really this northern kingdom of Israel, that the lost tribes that are coming in. Um, so it's completely different from Messianic Judaism in theology. I mean, it's not aligned with the word of God. And the Messianic community has really spoken out about this. So um, the International um, Alliance of Messianic Congregations and Synagogues, they wrote a 60-page um, position paper refuting this doctrine and this teaching. And one of the things that they said here, I pulled a quote because I thought it was just perfect. Um, they say, the Hebrew roots message to the Gentiles is that the reason Messiah died was not to deliver the Gentile from sin, but to deliver the Gentile from being a Gentile. 
as if being a Gentile would somehow be unacceptable to God. So that's where it really starts to become another gospel. Because if we're making Yeshua's life, death, and resurrection, his shed blood about anything other than delivering us from sin and appeasing mm. the wrath of God, then we have another gospel. So if the teaching here is focused on the fact that Yeshua died to make us part of this Israelite community, then that is another gospel. So it's not only running antithetical to Messianic Judaism, but it is running antithetical also to some core beliefs of our faith. I am think I'm realizing in this conversation, one of the things I'm learning is I think that maybe my aversion or my hesitation to the Messianic Jewish community, community is that I had it mixed up with um, the, 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 the Hebrew roots people. Yeah. And I I think that I all this time have thought those were the same thing. Mm -hmm. And you've been so helpful to me to help differentiate these two movements that these are not the same thing. Yeah, not and, all. Yeah. So yeah. it's been very helpful. Yeah, and the Hebrew Roots Movement, it's really offensive to um, the Messianic community and even secular Jews. I was talking to a woman today who's a brand new believer as of this week. <laughs> and she said that she got on Facebook because she was really trying to figure out this thing about Yeshua. And she landed in one of these groups and they were saying all these weird things. And she was describing what they what she was saying, what they were saying. And she was terrified. But I was like, oh, that's a Hebrew Roots group. That's nothing, you know, that has nothing to do that's with. That's not us. Yeah. Yeah. So it's really offensive, but they basically misappropriated Jewish traditions and that in itself is offensive. Um, but when they say Hebrew roots, what they're really talking about is your genetic or spiritual <laughs> Israelite Hebrew roots. Yes. But in the Messianic community, when you hear that language Hebrew roots, because that idea of roots is really Judaic, um, you know, the Hebrew language is built on a root system, a Shorish system. Right. We know that Yeshua is the root of Jesse. And even though the Jewish people don't recognize Yeshua as the Messiah, they still understand that that's a Messianic prophecy and that the Messiah is the root of Jesse. And then in the New Testament, when we talk about Romans 11, the root of that olive tree is understood to be Yeshua. So this idea of roots is very Judaic. And... You're going to hear that in the Messianic community. You're going to hear them talk about Hebrew roots. You're going to hear them talk about Jewish roots. And so I think it's really important when you see that to stop and define some terms, um, try to figure out who it is that you're talking to or who's talking to you and how they're processing the law in light of the core doctrines of our faith. Um, and not conflate the two movements as the same because it's really not. One's very cult-like and one is our faith um, expressed more with a Judaic or Hebraic sort of um, tone to it. Yeah. Um, you know, so it's two very different things. That's so helpful. This is so clarifying. I really appreciate this. Well, let me um, ask you this as we kind of wrap up here is, what are some of the common mistakes that you see when Gentile Christians interact mm -hmm. with Jews, uh, their Jewish friends, who don't yet know or believe in Jesus as a Messiah? Yeah, um, I think probably the biggest one is just not having an understanding of um, Christian anti-Semitism and the history of that and how it really has been an obstacle for us to have um, fellowship and relationship with them and also for them to come to their faith. It really, it really is important to do a little bit of learning about that and just to understand just how deep that is with the people. So I think that would be the first thing. Um, also, you know, they just have a few different, they approach things a little differently than us too. Like, um, the way that they live their life, they call it the halakha. Uh, we might call that like tertiary issues, like personal conviction, matters of personal conscience, you know, your personal faith expression. But the way that they live their life is a lot more central 
And when it comes to issues that we might consider primary or secondary, they're really a lot more open to having some mystery and not quite understanding it. In fact, they kind of go into those issues expecting that there's going to be some disagreement. Um, and they kind of like, I think sometimes they like that, like that debate between the rabbis on hard to understand issues. Um, so they sort of come at our faith in a different way. Um, but I also think I've seen some Christians make some mistakes about just what their expectations are for how the Jewish people understand scripture. And there's sort of two, two sides of the coin to this. Like on one hand, I see some people assume that maybe they know a lot of God's word um, because they're Jewish and they have a tradition that's rooted in the Old Testament and the Tanakh. Um, when really maybe they know more about the rabbinic writings and the Talmud. But then I see the other side of that too, where there's some assumption that maybe they don't know God's word at all and they only know the rabbinic traditions. So I think you have to make sure to just really approach your Jewish friends as individuals and really allow those friendships to be really mutual um, and real. Like no one, no one in my life is a project for me. <laughs> Um, all of my friends are sincerely my friends and I benefit from them and I hope that they're benefiting from me, but I'm not, you know, I'm not making any relationship a project. They're all sincere relationships. And I think that's really important. Um, and I also am really fine with like being upfront about who you are, um, early on because they do have, um, a history of people being deceptive with them. So I just like to, I mean, I don't shake their hand and say, hi, I'm Callie, a Gentile Christian. <laughs> but, you know, sort of early on in the friendship, I will let them know that I'm a believer in Yeshua. Um, you know, like that's my heart and my faith and what I believe to be true and what is true, you know. Um, but, you know, I think you kind of can work into that in a way that makes sense. But I think it is helpful to be upfront about that for sure. Very good. That's super helpful. Um well, again, I'm going to put some links to resources in the description here. Callie uh, put me on to a few that I've been enjoying that I want to make sure people know about. Uh, the One for Israel channel, I have just been uh, really enjoying the last few weeks since we talked. So much good teaching on there. I'm so impressed with the rich uh, intellectual tradition that these fine scholars at One for Israel are putting out um, important mm -hmm. and unique arguments and case making for the faith if we want to reach our Jewish friends and family. So go check out their content, Jews for Jesus. We mentioned earlier that's, um, you know, a, a kind of a, an apologetics oriented mm -hmm. site to help us uh, Reach Our Jewish Neighbors. Dr. Michael Brown um, does a lot. It's, he has a whole playlist that, on his channel where he responds to uh, rabbinic teachings. Now, now, I know Dr. Brown is a little bit controversial sometimes in his support of the new apostolic reformation or his ambigu ambiguity about his support. Yeah. But um, um, on this issue, I think uh, we can... Um, definitely find some common ground. Yes, definitely. I wouldn't pass him by on this issue because you don't like his statements on the other one. <laughs> yeah. So there's, uh, you mentioned earlier, the International Alliance of Messianic Congregations and Synagogues. They have a lot of great statements on doctrine on their website. So lots to explore. The Messianic and learn. Jewish Alliance of America is another one. Okay, great. Yeah. So thank you so much, Callie. And I'm going to definitely be calling you up and seeing if you will, uh, maybe we could have a conversation about the law and uh, its role in the life of the Christian sometime. In the oh, yeah, that would be great. <laughs> I think it would be wonderful. <laughs> thank you so much for sharing and for your heart for the Jewish people and yeah. uh, helping us, helping to be a, be a, I see you as like a cultural bridge in, in just making these things understandable for us as Gentiles and just that we can do a better job of communicating mm -hmm. with others. That's really the goal. So thank you so much. Yeah, thank you for having me.
Once again, that was Callie Mitchell from Israel. I really hope you enjoyed this conversation. I look forward to your feedback. I really hope you'll take some time to drop me an email or send me a DM about what you thought about the conversation. I hope you'll share it with a friend. Let me know if there's any other topics you would like me to do along these lines related to our special relationship between uh, Gentile Christians and Jewish Christians. Thanks so much for watching. Good night and God bless.